Good afternoon and welcome to Fire in the Belly. Today we have myself, Pete Lawton, and we're joined here today by Mike Armstrong. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are we getting? Where are you calling us from today, Mike? I'm calling from a, a place called Penarth Marina, which is just outside Cardiff in South Wales. Ah, beautiful, beautiful. So, Mike, tell us, who are you and where do you come from? Uh, well, um, I'm a current uh, author. Um, I'm a speaker. I want to be a global speaker. Uh, I'm a mentor and coach. And uh, recently, I've become a poet. Ah, okay. So, go on, give us the book. What's, what's, what's your book? Uh, well, I've written a book uh, called uh, Bounce Back. A human survival story and it's basically uh, my life story and about how I managed to overcome adversity using personal development and goal setting etc uh, in order to get my uh, life back on track really after a, a few sort of uh, bumps in the road if you like. Okay I'm sure we'll hear more about that later so that's great. So tell me where, where are you from originally then where did you where did you grow up and who are you? Yeah, well, I'm from Cardiff. Um, I grew up uh, either in Cardiff or around Cardiff. Um, I moved around quite a lot um, because my mum and dad got divorced when I was eight. So uh, I think I worked out uh, while I was writing my book. I, I went to seven schools uh, by the age of uh, 16. I lived in seven houses. So uh, I think uh, that helped me in my life because I was uh, sort of forced to make friends a lot. And I think that's a skill which has uh, seen me uh, do okay throughout my life, whether I've been in a sales job or whether I've been self-employed as I am now doing networking. Um, those skills of uh, you know, making friends, building relationships is, uh, is skills that have seen me okay you know, through my life. Brilliant. So then have you brothers and sisters? And... So yeah, I was uh, brought up with one older brother who was uh, two years older than me in two months. Uh, a lot later on, my mum remarried and I had two sisters then, okay. uh, but a for a long time, it was just me and my brother and um, he's very competitive and I'm very competitive and we had a competitive dad. So um, that's another skill which have helped me in my life because uh, my dad and my brother would never let me win anything. So I had to go out and fight for whatever I wanted. And um, that's something which, uh, again, has helped me through my life. Um, you know, I played a lot of sports when I was a kid. And so being uh, uh, younger to a, an older brother and having a dad who wouldn't let you win, you know, you learn to become tough and uh, competitive. And uh, that's seen me have a very successful early sporting career, really. I, um, I played for the school rugby team. I was the fastest boy in junior school. I used to win all the events on sports days. So I got used to winning and a winning mentality. Um, I played number eight for the school team. Um, I also played for the school baseball, basketball, uh, football teams. Um, I did a bit of running, um, did a bit of discus. So I was a very active child and, and very competitive at it. Like, you know? Well, okay. So you were, so that's, that's quite a range. I mean, had you a specialty or was just trying everything? Well, rugby was my specialty. I, I didn't have a rugby ball out of my hand from the age of seven till about 15. Um, when I played uh, rugby at the school, uh, we were, I went to Corpus Christi High School, which is a Catholic school. And for the first three years, we won the league and cup double. Um, I also played sevens because I was fast and I played on the old Cardiff Arms Park. Um, so again, I got used to winning and success and I literally had a rugby ball in my hand 24-7 from the age of seven to 15 and uh, loved it. And actually my biggest regret in life is I didn't make it as a professional rugby career because of a few moves and a few sort of family things that sort of detracted from, from what I believe I could have been a very good international rugby player, but I'm confident and full of self-belief, so why wouldn't I think that? But I, I, I went down a different path, you know, a sales path, entrepreneurial path. Sure, sure. So tell me this, it's, I don't know, say seven years of age, who would we have met if we had met your seven-year-old self? Who would I have met? Yeah, well, who, who, what would your character have been at seven? Say? What was I like? Um, mm. So I was a cheeky, cheeky little kid, really, I think, uh, full of energy, full of, I was out all the time as, as he was uh, back in the sort of 70s, early 80s. You were out constantly on my bike or doing adventure. Um, I'd say I was pretty fearless. Um, I've never been frightened of anything in my life. So I used to sort of be trying, uh, climbing up trees, jumping off steps, uh, doing things like parkour before parkour even existed. 
you know, just literally running along railings, jumping off uh, posts, uh, jumping on um, leap, leapfrogging um, railings and, and, and those big posts you get, um, jumping on roller skates downstairs, uh, doing, um, doing um, uh, jumps on uh, mountain bikes, uh, diving fast down hills on mountain bikes, just anything in uh, anything you know that was fearless, that was sort of a bit cheeky. You know, I was just boisterous, really, and full of energy. And, and I'm the same now, still full of energy, still full of life. Wow, that's awesome! I forgot to actually say to you. I mean, what what does you know fire in the belly? What does that mean to you? Well, fire in the belly means uh, passion, enthusiasm for what you do, passion and enthusiasm for life. Mm. Um, I'm a massive believer that you should chase your dreams, chase your goals. Um, and you should be doing something that you enjoy, that sort of you, you buzz when you get up every day for, rather than something that, uh, you know, you don't want to go to work for or you don't want to do every day. So, you know, it's chasing your dreams, chasing your goals, uh, firing the belly, something I, I just massively believe in. You know, you can't give people passion or teach them passion and enthusiasm. You can teach them plenty of skills, but uh, you've either got passion, fire in the belly, or you haven't. Um, but often it's whether you're chasing the things you want to be chasing or not is where, where that fire comes from. Hmm. And would you say everyone's born with it or what's your take on that? Um, I would say um, that most people are born with a passion to do something, but the system lets them down a lot and the system irons out that passion a lot of the time. Um, parents iron out that passion. Um, people are told they can't do this, they can't do that, they can't achieve that aim lower, aim for something that's possible, all those sort of things. I was blessed to have a very strong mother. Um, like you say, uh, she got divorced from my father at a young age and brought us up as a single parent for a while before she met someone else. And she always um, gave me confidence that I could do whatever I wanted to do. I could believe and achieve whatever I wanted to achieve. And um, that's something I've kept with me all through my life. And I believe everything is possible. There is no such thing as impossible. It's just uh, whether you believe you can do something or not. Um, so I like the saying, uh, you know, you, you either can or you can't, but either way, you're right. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's quite, it sounds like your mother's quite uh, forward thinking, very positive thinking. Oh, yeah, very confident lady, very um, loving, very sort of um, generous, who you up, you know, um, just. Yeah, just a great woman, really. And also um, her mother, which is my nan, which is the Irish connection. Obviously, we met through the Outstanding Network, and it's mostly predominantly the Irish. And uh, my nan, um, who's my mum's mum, obviously, uh, she was an Irish lady from Dublin. And uh, she's probably the strongest woman I've ever met. And I've met a lot of women in my life. And so, you know, a lot of her genes come down to my mum and then pass down to me. And, uh, you know, that's something I'm very grateful for. Mm -hmm. Wow, okay. So what age are you out of interest, Mike? I'm 42, nearly 43 years young, but uh, I've been telling people for about 20 years that I'm 20 for 20 years. But actually, I'm three years beyond that, which is how quick time goes. But I feel 20, and, uh, you know, I try and keep the energy of a young, fit 20-year-old. Wow, fair play. So, I mean, it sounds like certainly in your, your childhood, you were, you were pretty much hard to keep down. You were sort of doing all sorts and everything, really. Yeah, 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 yeah. I remember um, me and my brother used to go to um, Empire Pool, which is an Olympic-sized pool in the summer. And uh, we used to sort of uh, jump off the top board, which is a 10-meter high board. And I used to do a handstand off there. And uh, occasionally we'd do a Mr. Bean, which was uh, from the program, Mr. Bean, where he'd be hanging on the end of the board. Wow. And you'd end up getting kicked out and then allowed back in the next session. Um, but yeah, just uh, just playing like uh, touch and tag and um, things like that, off jumping off the dive boards and spending our bus fare home on chips and having to run home. Just, you know, crazy times, really. That's it. So you and your brother, I suppose, were quite, quite close together, were you? Yeah, well, yeah, he was two years older than me, but I've always been a bit more mature than him. So we, we leveled ourselves off a bit. We were, we were really good friends for, for a long time, like, you know, until he got a bit older and, you know, lives, you know, we drifted a bit, you know, and always been in and out of our lives then from adulthood. But as kids, we were, we were like best friends, really. Oh, wow. That's awesome. So how was, how was the school side for you then? Was it same or? 
Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. Um, you know, my book, uh, my entrepreneurial story book, uh, starts with, uh, you know, I'm not not much like on other entrepreneurs. I didn't have the um, dyslexia. I wasn't extremely poor. You know, I wasn't wealthy, but I didn't, you know, I wasn't poor. Um, I didn't have a lot of hassle or, 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 or troubles growing up. I was pretty academic. You know, I had two A's, six B's and three C's at GCSE and two A levels. Um, I was a grade A student. Had I not moved around so much, I probably would have done better than that. Um, I was predicted uh, an A and two Bs um, to go off to university, but I'd found uh, a career in sales by then and decided that was enough for me. I didn't want to go to university and get myself into debt. I wanted to just be an MD of a company or run my own company. And I thought, well, a job in sales is a good path to that, but, you know. Well, wow, okay. So start off with um, first job, I mean, first sort of element of earning money and things like that. Hmm. Well, my first element of earning money uh, started at about 11 years old, uh, of age. Um, I used to um, have Sky TV. We had it uh, for Christmas, me and my brother, because we shared a room. And um, we were one of the first people to have it. Um, it only had two movie channels on at the time, Sky Movies and the Movie Channel. And I used to record the uh, films and sell them to the kids in school on the VHS. So that was a venture I used to do. Um, and another venture I used to do, um, I used to go to Hypervalue and buy uh, boxes of matches in large quantities and sweets and then break them into smaller uh, quantities and sell them to the kids in school. So I had a bit of an entrepreneurial flair of a young age. Um, I also did, uh, you know, newspaper round and at uh, 15, I helped uh, an uncle of mine who was in business um, uh, in his salvage yard. And then uh, at 16, or I think I was just 15, turning 16, after school in the summer holidays, I had my first sales job uh, doing door to door sales for a double glazing company. Well, okay. You know, so, uh, yeah, I was earning a couple of hundred pounds a week living um, in Cardiff with my nan because uh, my mum had moved out of Cardiff at that time. So I was living as an adult, if you like, at sort of 15, 16, earning a couple of hundred pounds a week. And I did that all summer, having a great time uh, until college started. You know? Wow, okay. Well, take us back. Do you remember what, uh, what particular movies you were copying off the uh, Sky Movies? Yeah, I remember it was sort of anything with um, Arnold Schwarzenegger or Sylvester Stallone, mostly, you know, his um, Running Man, I remember, was one, um, you know, all the Rockies, um, oh, Commander, I think, was a Sylvester Stallone one, um, there was, uh, oh, what was the one, Red something or other, where he was uh, a barbarian warrior, Not, uh, mostly action films, because I was an action-packed kid, and uh, I've always loved action film. Die Hard is something I rewatched again recently. I loved that film back then. Oh, um, wow. Yeah, you know, all those sort of films. Great films. So you the were there straight onto the VHS. Get it yeah, on. Watching these films course. way before anyone else, like way before people had Sky, like, you know? Wow, okay. How much were you selling the VHS for? Do you remember? I can't remember at the time, no, but um, probably not a lot, you know, probably a couple of pounds. Pocket money. Well, fair play. That shows entrepreneurship. You can see it coming through there immediately. It's great. It's great. Yeah. So, so take us through then. So, I mean, the salvage yard and, and things like that. What, what were you doing there? Uh, there, I was just grunting, really, uh, helping my uncle who owned the yard, uh, you know, uh, pack up the, the, the van, uh, drop off, um, you know, patio slabs and anything heavy that had been salvaged, building like construction materials and garden materials mostly. We'd, um, you know, deliver them to the, the people who bought them, either who'd come into the salvage yard or bought them online or over the phone. And we'd have to sort of load the van with big, heavy stuff and then unload it at the other end. And uh, it was uh, backbreaking, hard work. But I was a young, fit kid and I enjoyed it, you know. We took a bit of the steam out of you too. So yeah, sure. pro probably, yeah. So 16 then, you go on double, double glaze sales. I mean, how on earth did you get into that? Uh, an uncle of mine uh, phoned me about the blues, knew I would uh, start the six weeks holiday, just finished school, was uh, starting a job there, asked me if I wanted to go down to. And uh, I said, yeah, why not? And uh, that's actually one of the biggest things in my life. I changed the course of my life. A um, couple of uh, days later, or maybe a couple of weeks later, my uncle wasn't there anymore. Um, it was a big turnover business. A lot of people didn't last. It was very hard work. But I just seemed to love it. I seemed to thrive at it. Like, you know, it was something which um, I think is a great grounding for anyone in sales. Because if you can do door-to-door -door sales selling double glazing, then pretty much everything gets easier than that after that. 
Sure. So tell me, what was your style? How are you, how are you selling the double glazing then? Well, it was a, it was a double sale. Um, you used to have to um, pitch in order to get listened to and then pitch in order to pitch your product, your service. So, you know, it was a double sale. I learned back then um, to get in quickly. And it's a trait I've, I've, I've eased off, but I still have a bit, you know, so to get in before other people can give you the objection, get in, give them something, a, a, a buzzword or you know, press a button of something. Different people have different things that they're interested in. And if you can push a button early on and gain interest, then, uh, or even have a laugh with them, then they'll relax and start listening to you and you can actually get your pitch in. Mm -hmm. um, another strategy I learned early on was to take their bullets away from the gun. So if you unarm them, then they can't actually uh, give you uh, the, the shots. So I used to say things like, I know you're not interested, I know you can't afford it, and I know it's the last thing on your mind right now, but, and then give them the positive. So actually give pull out the objections and overcome them before they gave you the objections. So that was a strategy I learned early on. Where did that come from? I mean, where, where were you sort of learning this from, do you know? Um, I've been always into puzzles. I, I'm a problem solver. I love puzzles. I'm creative. I'm educational. You know, I'm academic. Played a lot of sports. So I learned how to use the same skill sets, if you like, hand-eye coordination and pace but in different environments. So I, I, I got used to fixing problems, I think, and I was massive into gaming. Uh, so I used to play Pac-Man on the old Asteroid. Um, and then I used to play uh, the Nintendo. And I used to play, play, play the game until I beat it. And then I wouldn't touch it again. So I was always wanted to get to the next level, the next level, the next level, the next level. I'm very progressive. And that is another trait which has helped me through my life. Well, so I suppose, I mean, that's interesting. When, when you actually beat the game, what would you do? Celebrate and then just move on. <laughs> you know, short celebration, which I, I believe you should never get too enthusiastic over anything and never get that too down over anything. You know, mm. a nice consistent plateau is the way to go through life, really. You know, a um, bit like a lot of football managers say the same thing. Don't get carried away when you win and don't get downhearted when you lose. Just do the same thing. Do what's right. If you do what's right day in, day out and, you know, let everything else takes care of itself, really. Like, you know, don't get carried away with yourself. Right now. Mm. So you're 16 year old, you're turning up at doorsteps, you're talking about double glazing and all that. How's, you know, what was your success rate or what was your, your forte here? Um, so my job was to uh, book appointments for other guys to turn up and sell. And uh, I was booking lots of appointments, uh, you know, um, sort of three, four, five a day, sometimes more, when on average people were doing one or two. You know, I've always um, had a bit of a gift of the gab, a um, bit of the uh, uh, Irish trait in me again. Um, I've always been determined, cheeky, so not, not frightened to ask, which a lot of people are. Um, so I've always been a bit cheeky, um, determined, very driven, uh, hard, hard because of the moving around and maybe my mum and dad's divorce at a young age. And my mum and my brother were a lot more emotional than me. I was a bit of the, the rock. Um, in addition to having an Irish grandmother, uh, I've got an a English grandfather from Yorkshire. And I would say I definitely got a bit of that Yorkshire grit in me as well. Not only um, was my grandfather Yorkshire grit, no emotion and that sort of stuff, uh, but he married my nan. He met her in a, a, the RAF and they were very sort of uh, stoic people. Mm -hmm. And so I, I got a you know, I got a bit of that, you know, Irish gift of the gab and charm, but quite a lot of that Yorkshire grit in me as well. So you've always been, it sounds like you're all, you're a bit of a scrapper. You just keep going and going, you know, you don't, don't know what no is. I'm a fighter. Yeah. Um, I'd never give up. No retreat, no surrender is a film from the eighties. I, I remember selling and it's a, a line I, I love. Um, you know, I'm about uh, just never giving in. Um, another a line that I love from the Rocky movies is, life's not about how hard you can hit, but it's about how hard you can get hit and keep going forward. Mm. You know, lots of these lines from movies and books and more later on in life quotes from entrepreneurs uh, are mantras of mine. They're, they're things I take on board and I, they're, they're just part of me. They're part of my DNA. Wow. I love it there. And is your, is your brother of a similar trait then? Do you, would you both be on a similar path? Um, or? No, he's a, he's a bit more easygoing. My brother 
I like to have fun uh, and my brother sort of takes that to the max if you like you know we're both not shy and retiring characters but he, he he enjoys himself a little bit more and um so he, he he wasn't so quick to go in to build a career like I was funny enough he's he, he, later on in life he's he's building a really good career now and he's you know, running teams and that sort of thing, same sort of stuff that I did a bit earlier than him. So he was just a bit more enjoying himself for longer. I learned how to um, earn money, work hard and party at the same time because I know how to party too, like, you know? <laughs> I love it. I love it. So you're going through 16, you're going through then A-levels, the whole thing through school, yeah? Yeah, well, I decided uh, I enjoyed earning the money and uh, luckily I could work, most of the money could be earned evenings and weekends. So when I did my um, A-levels, I got a, a job at a, a sister company, basically a different branch. I was in Staybright Cardiff um, in the summer doing door-to-door. -door. So I transferred to Staybright Newport um, and I was doing evenings and weekends telesales. So I carried on earning money, a couple of hundred pounds, two to two fifty a week all the way through my college. And uh, every time I had uh, breaks, um, weeks off and half terms and summer holidays, I, I went full time. That's, that's some serious money for a fairly young guy. I mean, I'm trying to work it out. That's, where are we there? We're, we're sort of- About 12, 12 to 15 grand a year, maybe more. You know, 20, 23, 24, five, six, seven years ago. So it's yeah, your early 90s, is that right? Yeah, you would be. Yeah, 92, 93, um, that's sort of age, 94, 95 um, in college. Um, I earned a lot more money at 21, so I'll, we'll move on to that at some point when the question mm. comes. But um, yeah, like, I've been used to earning good money from an early age. And what, what were you doing with the money out of interest? <laughs> like I said, I like to party. I was going out, uh, there, there was a time when I was uh, doing uh, sales door to door. And then I was going out uh, sort of Monday, Tuesday, well, every night of the week, except for maybe Sunday or, or maybe Monday. So I was going out partying. I, when I actually went into full-time sales after finishing college, um, I was able to work 12 till 8. So I didn't start till 12 in the morning. I was working 8 till the evening because we wanted to obviously make sure you were working 5 till 8, which is when people were home from work, a better sure. time to catch them. Yeah. So um, I was able to go out then after 8 o'clock, you know, half 8, 9, half 9, and stay out till 3 in the morning, get 8 hours sleep and still get up at 11 in time for work. That's some serious uh, persistence there and, and fair play to you. I love that. That's a yeah. lot, of, lot of energy. Yeah, so well, came... uh, that, that actually led on to uh, a career for me. Uh, one of my proper first self-employed jobs, um, which we can go into a, a, a bit more in a bit, but also back to college. There's some interesting choices I made back in college, which we may want to cover too. Sure. So you, so you finished up in school then. What, what, was, what happened next? Yeah, so like I said, I was working um, evenings and weekends around college. And uh, at the end of the first year, I decided that I wasn't going to go and uh, do, do my A-levels. I thought I'd just stay on and um, uh, carry on doing sales, like, you know. So once I decided that I wasn't going to go to university and I didn't need the grades, I decided to drop one of my subjects because it gave me a bit more time to do working around. And uh, I didn't actually go to college much the second year. Um, I wanted to carry on and do... Um, my exams because I thought well I've done a year I might as well get something for them I wasn't really focused and interested anymore because I decided I didn't really need my results so I was uh, just working more and more and more uh, you know in my job um, I upset my mum the only time I think I really remember upsetting my mum was telling her I wasn't going to go to university um, because uh, she really wanted me to and I was capable of um, after the, my first year exams I was predicted an A and two B's at A level uh, but I dropped the sub one of the subjects I was predicted to be in, which was economics. I upset Mr. Vaughan, um, the economics teacher, who was also my form tutor at that time as well. Uh, but I decided I was just going to be an entrepreneur and enter the entrepreneurial world. So I hardly went uh, the second year. Um, and I did my exams and I managed to get two Ds without any revision and just off the year, the first year um, lessons, the memory of that, really. I'm lucky I got a good memory. Wow. Fair play. So what, what were the two subjects you ended up with then out of interest? I did uh, accounts uh, and geography. So I was doing accounts, economics and geography. 
Mm-hmm. Um, but I dropped economics. I, I love economics, actually, and I love looking at the economy and all that sort of thing. I love analysing the effects of, for example, the global credit crunch and more recently now the, the coronavirus and that sort of thing. And I'm big into economics. And I, and I was actually second in the class at the end of the first year exam. It was a very difficult uh, subject and I was predicted to be at it. So that's why Mr. Vaughan was upset. But um, I just decided it didn't serve my purpose, and you know I dropped it. I, it gave me a, it was the subject that gave me a day and a half off a week, so I can do more work. Whereas the other subjects didn't give me that. They, they, they you know, they didn't give the the break in time as much. Makes sense. And had you anyone inspirational at that time that you were you were looking to? I mean, you mentioned your mother and Mr. Vaughan and things like that. I mean, is there anyone that stands out for you? Yeah, well, um, lots of um, lots of my uh, uncles and aunties were in sales or business. My mum was a bit self-employed. She'd do a few bits uh, on the side, a flower arrangement and that sort of thing. Uh, like I say, my uncle had a salvage yard. Um, my other uncle was in sales. Um, uh, actually, two of my uncles, one on my mum's side and one on my father's was in sales. So I think um, it's a family trait, really, to have a bit of the gift of the gab and negotiation skills and that sort of thing. Um, from a, um, a well-known point of view, I've admired Richard Branson from about the age of 11. I loved the way that he was making money and having a good time doing it. And I thought, you know, that's the blueprint for life. Um, so at the, that time, he was flying around the, the world in his balloons, getting PR. And, you know, and I just thought his branding was great. It was sexy. It was quality. It was just what I thought a business should be about. So, um, so that's, uh, you know, the person I was looking up to and probably looked up to all through my life. Um, other than more recently when I got to know, you know, the last three or four years, some more um, inspirational and, and awesome people. Yeah. Is this, Cause I do remember a lot of that, you know, and well, I'm, I'm 40 and you know, you're 42, do you say? Um, yeah. So yeah, I remember, I mean, the, the big sort of the big balloons he used to do and then he did the Atlantic crossing, you know, and Richard Branson was really sort of out there in terms of, public challenges you know we only had channels one two three i remember four coming and i remember five coming you know so five channels and then richard branson going up in those huge big silver foil balloons and it was, it was yeah, really awesome quite dressing something up as an air, dressing up as an air stewardess and you know just doing anything that that, that got his name out there like you know just an awesome legend and and, and i had a chance last year but, but it was beyond me financially to, to meet him and go to Necker Island. Wow. Um, friends of mine went and uh, they're going again this year and also going out on a boat to, to celebrate his birthday. That's still on in July. So um, things, you know, I'm, I'm looking to try and find a way of achieving, but don't quite know the way yet. Yeah. You mentioned then some of the words you were saying, you know, you're very driven, obviously, at that young age. What was driving you, do you know? Um... Just the belief that, um, the belief in myself, you know, confidence that I could do whatever I wanted to do, uh, aspirations to be as good and as big as Richard Branson. Um, coming from a, a, a split up home when my mum got divorced, I was financially reliant on myself from probably the age of 11, really, other than birthdays and Christmases when my mum would buy me whatever I needed, whatever I wanted. I used to fund my own clothes, entertainment, shopping, that sort of thing. So I just, I suppose it started out of necessity, my entrepreneurial flair, and, and I carried on doing it because I enjoyed it. I loved it. I, like, I was earning good money at it. Why wouldn't I want to keep doing it? Mm, so it makes I'm sense. So I always wanted to compete with those around me, get mm. better, be the best in the company, which I've often been in sales. You know, didn't start off that way, but I used to study and assess the other people around me, or I was competing with, and find a, a way of beating them. And and hard work and persistence and putting in the extra hours would often be my strategy. Well, fair play. I mean, that's you know, it's, it's great to see. I mean, obviously, the hunger is there from a, an early age, and it's always interesting to see, you know, is it a desire to move forward or is it a, you know, a sort of a desire to not have a lack, you know? So there, if you're saying it's it's down to the more money you had, you know, the harder you worked, the more money you had, then you know, the, your choice was yours. You know, it's it's that's interesting. Right, yeah. Also, uh, I'm a lifelong learner, and I think when you're educated, you start working out how to play the game. So, you know, this is a game of life. We're all playing it, and we're all competing against each other. And so you've got to sort of look at, okay, who, who's in my space, and how can I be better than them? How can mm-hmm. I be bigger? You know, how can I, be, how can I outsmart them? How can I be, um, you know, switched on and maybe more technically advanced than them? 
You know, there's loads of ways of, of outperforming and outbeating people and no man is an island, you know, we're all, we're all in this world together. So we've got to find out, okay, how do we, you know, we're fighting over the same resources. How do we win? How do we become the best at what we do? And it's only by taking on information, learning to improve and, and w wanting to get better. Absolutely. Absolutely. So take us then forward, you know, what's the next stage in your journey? So uh, following, um, well, so at 21, uh, I was running teams. I'd started at 18 being a team leader and I had my own team. Um, started off, first of all, being a, a team leader in telesales. And then I, when I finished full-time college, I went into field sales and I used to run a, a team with a minibus and there was you know, enough room for about 12 people. We'd be doing door-to-door -door canvassing. And I was getting my own leads and my own commission, but also an override off the team as well. So that's the start of my sort of uh, helping other people as well to, to you know, share my skills and my knowledge with them to get them to be better in order for me to make more money as well. So at 20, I think, or 1920, I was headhunted. Um, I was at Staybright at the time and I got headhunted by Cold Seal, a competitor, to go and work for them in a newly opened branch in Cardiff. And I went to work for them and I was having a great time there as well. Um, I was living in a house with uh, most of my team. Uh, we were sharing the house and partying together, working hard, playing hard. And uh, at 21, I earned about 40 grand. So I was earning 40 grand, living the life. I had a driver because I wasn't uh, driving myself. So one of my, my, my minibus driver for, for the company used to be my chauffeur out of hours. Um, I was eating takeaways and partying all the time and loving, loving life until I got to 21. So at 21, I earned 40 grand. What I realized then as well is that I, from 16 to 21, I'd been working evenings and weekends. So I hadn't really, even though I got to enjoy partying, I hadn't really done much productive in, in these sort of hours that you normally work five till eight, five to nine, five to 10, that sort of thing. I wanted to get a bit more stability and, and, and just you know, ease life off a little bit from, from those sort of crazy work hard, play hard days. I thought, you know what, I, I'd like to get my weekends back was the main one, really. Get my weekends back because I was always working, you know, sort of 10 till 6 on a Saturday and Sunday. And so I decided to go look for a B2B job, working Monday to Friday, 9 to 5. Uh, but with a caveat, I needed to still try and earn the same sort of commissions and stuff. And that proved to be the difficulty at the time because in the B2B world, they don't sort of pay the same as they do if you're doing well in the B2C world. So I tried quite a few jobs for a while different um, telesales jobs um, and then I passed my driving test and did a few field sales jobs and I was just looking for a place where I could have a career and stay somewhere for a while. I got fed up in the double glazing world because it wasn't much more for me to learn either. I wanted to keep learning. I had a thirst and a hunger for learning and I wanted career progression and I felt at 21 I, I'd done that industry and you know also it was a time when um, there was a lot of uh, changes going on in the sector as well. New houses were being built with double glazing in rather than the old wood windows. So I could see the market and the, the environment changing. So I thought, you know, time to get out of this and do something else as well. So I'm a strategist and lots of these things went into my head at the time. Mm. And so, like I said, I tried lots of different things. I did um, uh, selling mobile phones over the phone. I sold CCTV uh, least cost routing. Then I passed my driving test and I did a bit of uh, telecoms. Um, I did a bit of radio advertising sales and then I did a bit of new, uh, new sorry, I did a bit of new, uh, newspaper advertising sales for the Argus, um, which is a big brand uh, owned by NewsQuest. And then I did a bit of radio advertising for Chrysalis. I went to work with Galaxy 101 in Bristol and I worked for their Bridge FM uh, site as well. So I started to get you know, better jobs than working my way into the commercial corporate world. Um, and in 2002, you know, I tried quite a lot of stuff, still haven't found um, the big commission earning stuff, but I'd got myself into the bit, a bit of a foothold in the corporate world. But at the same time, as I started passing my driving test, I started putting those fixed cameras all over the place. And being a rep, you know, rushing around, doing appointments and all of that, I kept picking up points here, there and everywhere. And my, I got up to nine points on my license and I thought, you know what, my, my license needs a breather. So I looked again for a telesales job, something which I'd done, you know, before I passed my test. And uh, I, I applied to a job. It was a tech startup business, a very fast growth company called CreditSafe. 
they'd only just started, so they weren't growing fast at the time. But the commission structure was good. It was telesales, and it was a chance for my uh, license to have a breather. So I took a telesales job. I only thought I'd probably be there for about six months, and uh, I was there for 10 years. And it was a hell of a journey those 10 years, like, you know? So Credit Safe, what exactly were they doing? So they're a credit reference agency, but really they're a sales company, yeah? Whatever they were selling didn't really matter. It was a, it was, it was a credit reference agency. Um, they come into the marketplace and disrupted the marketplace. Um, it was a, a marketplace that was sewn up by four um, major corporations, one, um, one from Europe and three from America. So I'm talking 50 years old to 100, 150 year old corporations like Experian, Equifax, Dun & Bradstreet and ICC. And Credit Safe went into the marketplace using uh, an inferior product to start with, but one that grew to a better product, but using technology and online to undercut the price. And, uh, and everyone in the organization were salespeople. It was hardcore, high pressure sales. And uh, we grew massively in, in the 10 years I was there. It grew, you know, huge. And I got promoted loads of times. I can go into that in a bit more detail, but just had a great time being part of a tech startup, you know, watching what is possible in business, learning from growth, growing pains and mistakes and rapidly growing and strategizing and thinking of new ways of doing things and improving things and learning efficiencies, all the sort of things you need for business and in life right now. Mm. Well, fair play, and, and I was going to say, in that, I mean, you, you were obviously in that job through the 2007-2008 crash as well. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I, uh, I got promoted nine times in six years. So um, I, was, I started off a telesales executive, and then I worked up to Premier Account Director, one under the MD, and, uh, in, in those six years. And I was one of the founding members of the Key Accounts Department. For the 10 years I was there, I was one of the two top sales people for all 10 years. But after two years, I was a team leader of the um, a tennis sales team on the, on the SME side. And then I was quickly put as a, a, a team leader of the key on um, as, as a sales guy. But I was working for one of my managers and I thought he had a, a safe job and was comfortable. So, so I wanted to progress into management. So I took a job as a, a SME manager rather than a key accounts manager. But a couple of months after doing that, they replaced me with a key accounts manager. So I ended up running the key accounts team that I used to be on and was one of the four founding members of and uh, never looked back. And then I, I run that corporate sales team for eight years. And uh, when I started, it was uh, seven people doing telesales to 10 million plus turnover businesses. And we were doing 300,000 pounds. And when I left, it was a department of 17 people and we were selling to 10 million plus turnover businesses and we were doing 5.7 million pounds, um, 1.7 million new business revenue. So a growth from 300,000 to 1.7, but we had 4 million in the pot of renewal that had been growing year on year on year that we were targeted 120% uh, growth on to grow. So I learned a lot through that journey. Like, you know? Sure. What was the drives? I mean, I assume obviously the money packages were, were looking quite favourable too. And but was I mean that many promotions? Is that is that a hunger that was coming for you, or were you chasing the money, or chasing the position, or what were you chasing? Do you know? It was uh, it was a dog eat dog, hard pressurised environment. But I excelled in that environment, and you know, I all of my attributes that we've covered already helped me excel in that environment. I was used to earning the money. I'm not frightened to take, take risks and take on more responsibility and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. I also have a strategy of act as if. So if you want to be the next job above you, you act as if you're doing it and then they give it to you. So, you know, it's a, it's a bit like some people say, fake it till you make it or whatever, you know, or, you know, um, you sometimes just got to do it. If you want to be the MD, then you've got to do the job of the MD and eventually you'll work your way up until you are the MD to take on the responsibilities, care about the business, be passionate, be enthusiastic, get involved, you know, show up, don't have time off, do all the things that you've got to do to get on in life. And I was one of those people, I was good at the job, so I was gifted, talented. I was able to sell and to, um, to learn new products and, and, and adapt those new promotions for customers. Um, but I was also, I worked longer hours than most people. I um, never had time off on a sick. I did all the things that you've got to do to get promoted. Well, that's it. And obviously, the, that dogged hard work was obviously paying off in spades. 
That's right. Yeah, if you're part of a, a good environment, and this was a good environment, high pressurized but good environment, then you can forge your own opportunities. And I used to sometimes create roles for myself to get promoted by doing them, by innovating. So you were saying there, you know, it's it's almost to act as if, you know, so you were you were looking at positions higher than your own and, and you would well tell me, I mean, you know, what was what was the characteristics or what were you doing? Was that is that again, was this conscious or was this something you were just doing by default? Um, I think it was uh, a bit of both, really. I think it was something that I was more naturally gifted towards. I think my progress, the fact that I like progression, you know, and I want to get up the next level, the next level, the next level, the next level from my gaming days, and, and the fact that I was competitive, so I wanted to beat the people around me, beat the people around me, beat the people around me. You know, I was determined, steely, uh, confident, you know, used to success. You know, just the right mix of uh, ingredients that you need to make, uh, you know, a fantastic uh, competitive uh, employee, you know, and I think um, that, that proved to be the case. And my bosses appreciated the fact that I was going above and beyond and I was successful at what I was doing and they would give me more and more um, opportunities. I also think the fact that it was a new business as well helped because usually, you know, uh, positions you know, you, you, ha you hit a glass ceiling and then you can't move up the next one until someone moves over or that sort of thing. But there was no glass ceilings, you know what I mean? There was no people in positions that you couldn't, you know, get, you know, get blocked by or whatever. It was just, you show what you can do and you get rewarded for it. And it's very good commission, similar to the double glazing day days. You know, good basic as well, though, which you, you never got in the double glazing days. So I was earning good, I was earning like, um, you know, 15 grand basic and 20, 25 grand in the early years, and I got up to earning sort of 30, 35 basic, 30, 35 grand a year later on, you know, so really sort of every year looking to get more, give myself a pay rise, take on more response to keep building, building, building like that. That's great, you know, and I suppose it's still a, a fairly young guy too, that's, that's sort of, that's great, there's good money to be on. You know, and so what, I mean, even what were you learning there? What were the key things from a sales perspective? Um, from a sales perspective, I learned um, not to sell people stuff, um, but actually to provide people solutions to their problems. So I learned to become a solution salesperson and not a salesperson. I believe a salesperson is someone who just tries to sell someone something that they don't need and they don't want. But a solution salesperson is somebody who listens to somebody identifies needs and uh, matches their product or their offering or their service to those needs. And I, um, I, I learned how to become a solution salesperson. I also learned how to use IT and technology to build solutions that other people who weren't so IT literate didn't know how to build. So to offer solutions that they wouldn't even be able to think of themselves because they didn't know about the component parts of those solutions. Sure, makes sense. Makes sense. So just explain from, from somebody who's, you know, not from the sales world. So you, you basically, you talk about, so you had a basic, so I'm assuming that's a basic salary that came in regardless of, you know, whether you made any sales or no sales or loads of sales, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Basic salary. And then I never had any company pension, still don't have one now. You know, um, I left uh, my company for self-employment just before they were coming in the company pension scheme. The automatic one but I always worked in companies where I was chasing the commission because I was sort of self-employed inside and I always considered my job as self-employed however much I put into it is how much I got out of there mm. I used to chase the big commissions rather than the you know comfortable packages and that sort of thing so um so yeah I was just always chasing the money always wanted to you know I like traveling so I always wanted to go nice places holidays that sort of thing i i love uh, nice environments i always wanted a nice house that sort of thing i bought property at an early age because i was earning the money and wanted to have something for it rather than just party it all away you know like i was doing in my earlier years so um yeah you know i think uh, i learned a lot about sales but mostly it was about how to use technology and how to provide uh, solutions you know to people's problems that was the main thing i learned um I also learned um, how to um, use um, systems and processes within a business to become more efficient. I use systems and processes to get more out of your staff. I learned that um, in business, 
there's lots of ways of doing things, but if you can do them much more efficiently, then it gives you more time to do other things. So you can actually get better and better and better by becoming more and more efficient at the things you do. So um, another big lesson I learned from, from those days was all about efficiency. So when I work with people now, that's one of the areas I like to cover, you know, technology and efficiency is, is my bag, like, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's something which um, so many businesses are underutilizing. So many businesses are um, inefficient in the way they do things. They're um, using, you know, old school methods of doing things rather than the fantastic modern technologies that are being created to make these things more efficient. And uh, that's sort of my niche area, really. That's where I excel in. Um, I used to have to go to large corporate companies, 10 million plus turnover businesses, but often some of the massive ones, 100 million plus, uh, people like um, Reebok and banks and build societies, um, Welsh Assembly government, people like that. And I used to have to go and have a look at their, their successful systems and work out how I could provide IT solutions to improve them. So, you know, these are successful businesses and little on me, you just have to sort of try and uh, find a way that we could develop some IT solutions to make them even better than they were already, you know, with the success they already had. Just out of interest, I mean, you know, I'm blown away by this sort of this growth path you've been on. I mean, what, what was your method of learning? How do you learn? Um, like I said earlier regarding the exams, I've got a brilliant memory. So uh, a lot of people think I'm like Rain Man because I do a lot of um, web design, social media marketing, uh, all that sort of thing at the moment. And I got usernames, passwords, URLs, it all in my head. Yeah. I even don't use a paper diary. I use my head for appointments and diaries. And uh, I just retain information extremely, extremely well. And so um, I've been on lots of internal um, sales training courses, IT courses. Um, I'm very good at uh, computer studies. I had a great day at GCSE computer studies. My mum and my awesome nan chipped together to get me a thousand pound computer off her little ones catalog when I was 11. And no one else had computers at the time either then, you know, so I had Sky on a computer. So I learned how to do stuff on a computer. When I went into the sales world then, especially when I started managing at 18, um, sales guys like to use IT and any excuse to get off the phone or to, 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 to interrupt themselves and give themselves a break. So I learned how to fix things and, and get them back working again. Um, and so I've always been into IT. And so working for a tech startup and selling IT solutions, a lot of my um, sort of lack of fear with IT helped me be at the top of the class or at the front rather than at the back. And the hardest thing when I was running a team was getting people who weren't IT lit to understand IT and technology in order to be able to offer the same sort of solutions that me and a couple of the other top sellers were understanding and able to offer to the corporate world. So, you know, technology has been massive in my life. And, uh, you know, I've probably got a lot to thank my, my mum and nan for, but that is definitely one of them. What was your first computer out of interest? Um, I think it was, uh, it was before the, the Spectrum ZX. It was uh, Lexmark, I think it was, something like that. It was like an unusual white thing, white big stacking system, not, not as old as the... Um, the sort of BBC computers that they used to have in primary school in the late mm. 80s, one of which I won for the school in a competition, by the way. It was a World Wildlife Project, and uh, we were doing a bird spotting competition, and I went to London with a couple of other kids from the school to represent the school, and we won a, one of those old BBC uh, you know, video printer type computers that just had text on it. That. It was better than that. It had floppy disks and software and basic sort of like Word and web design packages and stuff. And one of the reasons I got that computer was because my handwriting wasn't very good. I'm a lefty and I write through my, my, my writing, which spreads all the ink everywhere. And I always got ink at the bottom of my hand. So um, part of it was because I was academic and I was quite good in school. It was to help me get better grades by not by presentation style and that sort of thing. And what I learned early on with a computer is when you're doing like writing, you're writing essays and that sort of thing. It was great because you could sort of go back to them and you could squeeze stuff in spaces that you, you couldn't do before in, in writing and stuff. So I learned some of the, the valuable lessons and efficiencies that computers can offer you. Mm. Again, something I took into my later life. 
And you mentioned there, I suppose, systems and processes. Is, I mean, would your brain be quite logical then? Is that, is that what floats your boat? Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm extremely logical. You know, everything to me has to make sense. I, I sort of have a, a, a brain kerfuffle if it doesn't make logic, you know. So um, my, ex, my ex-wife, uh, I haven't covered on, on to get married yet, but the, the, um, my ex-wife used to have a bit of uh, dyslexia. And sometimes she would give me chores or errands to do, but you know they didn't make a, a, a logical sense. You know they would be like go here, they go there, and you'd be flip flip flopping around or whatever. And I'd have to sort of organise it in a way where you know it, it meant time and, and, and efficiency and logic. You know it has to go the right way, otherwise my head sort of malfunctions, doesn't compute. Fair play. So tell me, sorry, just a bit of an interlude there, but so yeah, tell me, tell me where are you going next then? So you, you've, you've obviously, you've been with that company then for 10 years, right? Yeah, so, so, so at the same time, uh, you know, early on in that company, I, I uh, met my future wife. Um, I met her out uh, clubbing, uh, as you do when you're out clubbing all the time. Uh, so I met my, fu- uh, my future wife. We had a great engagement for sort of five years. Um, we were going on holidays twice a year, you know, really getting to travel. Ibiza and Greece and all the islands, um, uh, Mallorca, uh, Gran Canaria, you know, doing all the, you know, lots of holidays, having a great time, lots of partying because we're earning good money, buying houses, properties, that sort of thing. Um, then I had uh, some kids come along. Um, we moved to a big house because uh, my, my wife was pregnant, uh, then I had my first child. And I had a, a second one two years later and a third one a year later as well. So we had three kids in uh, sort of four years. Um, wow. you, you mentioned the recession. Um, that was sort of 2005 to 2009. So mm-hmm. just while the global recession happened was in between my number two and number three. Nice. Yeah, so not, not the best of timings, which which actually is what makes my story a lot more interesting and we'll move on to at some point Mm. because I got chewed up and spat out by the global recession and uh, a lot of my book and my story is how I come back from that and the skills and the strategies I use to do so. So Mm. we can cover that at a later date. But you mentioned what happened then 10 years into the business. Well, six years, uh, you know, promoting nine times in six years, everything going great, one under the MD, under an MD that's not going anywhere. And I'm starting to think, you know, oh, am I going to get to MD? You know, it, it was a young MD. I was young myself, you know, am I going to displace this guy? Maybe not. You know, where's my room for progression? Starting to get itchy feet. Stayed in the company for four years with those itchy feet because of the kids coming along in quick concession and the global credit recession happening. But I always set myself a goal that I'd either be MD of a company by 30 or I'd be running my own successful company by 30. And I let it drift to about 35, so, which was the 10-year anniversary of my, my, my business, uh, of uh, my career. And I decided, you know what, I'm one under the MD. I don't think that you know, I'm going to get to that MD spot um, right now. So let's go on to plan B, the one I probably would prefer anyway, which is being MD of my own successful company. Wow, okay. So you got. So I decided to take the plunge for self employment during the recession or the plateau of the recession with three young children. So that was in around what, 2010, 2011? That was around uh, 2012. 2012, cool. So what was it? What did you go for? So I decided, well, I was an expert in the credit industry. I'd been in there for 10 years and I was probably the person in my company that knew the most about the industry. I used to go do the corporate talks and all of that around, around the country, especially in London. And uh, I thought, well, I could get into the credit industry because I'm an expert in this sector. But to be honest with you, it didn't really float my boat. Although I stayed there for 10 years, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it because it was a sales company, not because it was a credit information company. You know? and, and I thought, actually, it's sales and marketing I really like doing more than the credit industry. You know, one of the reasons I didn't go to university when I was doing accounts is because I could never see myself being an accountant. You know what I mean? And the credit industry is a bit like that. You know, uh, probably accounts and economics helped me in that credit industry. It helped me talk to credit managers and financial controllers and credit directors and finance directors and those sort of people because I had a bit of understanding of the information that they were looking at and assessing. But ultimately, what I enjoyed was just selling them the information so they could look at it themselves. 
And uh, and so what I realised is, although I know a lot about the credit industry, and probably that's where my value lies, having been in it for the last 10 years, and being national, and uh, being well known, um, but I thought, you know, I've been doing sales and marketing a lot longer than the 10 years career. I've been doing it since 11. So I thought I'd go into sales and marketing, what I know best. Mm. So I've become a consultant, trainer, and service provider. So you were training, you were training people for sales then, right? Yeah, well, um, actually, so although I do do some sales training, I do more marketing these days because the sales and marketing consultancy business in Wales was tough to get off the ground because people don't necessarily pay for intangibles, for knowledge and, and service and that sort of thing. They're, they're more likely to pay for tangibles, for products. Yeah. So I ended up, because I could do a lot of things, I ended up doing a lot of marketing for people because, you know, everyone, especially the older people that I was networking with, they knew how to do telesales and field sales and networking and expos, but they didn't know how to use Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn and blogs and SEO and all that sort of thing. So as Lord Sugar says, smell what sells. I, I smelt that that was the area that people needed more help in. So I ended up turning my, my business, MA Consultancy, from being just a sort of sales and marketing consultancy and training business into being more a uh, digital marketing agency and services business. I still do the consultancy and the training, and I still was back then, and I've started to do more of that now. But in the early years, um, I got asked to do more services than anything else. I used to provide the consultancy and the training along with the services as I, as I was delivering them. Wow. So how did you find being on, you know, out on your own then? You're saying it was slow to get started, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, business is hard work. Ninety uh, percent of businesses fail in the first five years. You know, and I've eight years going now, and there was a number of times during those five years I could have easily given it in. But I think because I'm hardcore, because I'm determined, because I'm I got a um, rhino skin. You know, because I'm a dog with a bone, I just won't let it go, and I, I wouldn't let it go. Mm. So I've just just stay at it, and you know, I've diversified as well because you know. Uh, I sell B2B and I get my business through networking. And so B2B and through networking, you have quiet times, things like um, August when business owners are on holiday, Christmas time when business owners aren't really thinking about you know, their business. They put it in that off till January. So you have quiet times. So I've learned to diversify. I've learned to um, you know, not spend a lot of money and enjoy myself and work on my own business in those quiet times. You know, I've, I've learned to adapt and, and get it on really. You mentioned there the recession. How was that for you? Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> well, there's a story. So, uh, so obviously, um, when when we had our first uh, child, just before that, when my wife was uh, pregnant, we decided to move house. So we moved from a four bedroom uh, house, um, which was about hundred eighty thousand pound, and we moved to a, a two hundred seventy five thousand pound four bedroom house on the other side of Cardiff. Uh, because we were going to be both closer to my parents and her parents. And uh, we thought it'd be better to be closer to the babysitters. So we moved uh, from one side of Cardiff to the other. We were both earning decent money. I was earning, obviously, you know, the main money, and she was an executive PA, so earning, you know, maybe 20 grand a year, 25, you know, around that sort of mark. So we were both doing quite well. And uh, we decided, yeah, we'd go for it. We bought a brand new house off plan, a red row house. And uh, it went up from 180 to 275, so quite a quite a big step. And then, um, and then the global credit uh, re recession happened not long after. But also to to add to the woes of the global credit crunch, uh, my wife decided after six months of maternity that it wasn't cost effective to go back to work because she'd spend you know more or less the same money as what she earned on childcare. So she didn't go back to work. And then we had another a, a second one and she didn't go back to work. And then the global credit recession hit and she didn't go back to work. And then we had another child. The first two planned, the third one, you know, a, a, a lucky accident. So all of a sudden we got three children. One, we gone from two salaries down to one and the global credit crunch has happened. Now, um, my ex-father-in-law was a financial advisor and I was talking at the time about uh, interest rates going up to 12 and 14% like they did in the 80s. 
we moved in in 2006, I think it was, mm -hmm. and our two-year fixed rate was up at the same time the credit crunch was on. So, um, thinking that the rates could go up to 12 to 40%, we signed up for five-year fixed on a 6.25% interest. I was paying £1,500 a month mortgage, and then the global credit recession happened, everyone's earnings took a dip, all the costs went up, they did some quantitative easing to help everyone through that situation with interest rates dropping down to 2% and 0.5% on the track and et cetera. And I'm still stuck on 6.25% for five years. Ouch. Yeah, ouch. So uh, not a great five years, let, let me tell you. Mm. I was gonna say on, on a 275, that's, that's, some, that's some serious dough. Yes, I used to have to earn like two and a half thousand pounds before I could buy a beer for myself. Hmm. How did you find that? I mean, you know, and I'm interested in you back in the day, you were saying, you know, if basically if you didn't earn it for yourself, then it didn't happen. And here again, you sort of find yourself in the situation that, as you say, you've got a, you've got a, almost a rent roll of two and a half grand just to, just to be able to have something for yourself. How was that for you? Yeah, well, just to survive, really, you know, before you start spending any money. And, um, yeah, so, um, you know, I've been under pressure all my, all my life, you know, the sort of jobs I've taken, the ones where if you're not hitting your target, you get sacked at the end of the month. So I work month in, month out, you know, under those sort of pressure conditions. And I believe under pressure is how diamonds are formed. So, you know, I, I, I'm very tough. I'm very mentally strong. I'm hardcore. I'm used to hitting targets. It, I didn't used to miss many, but those that I did would kill me for a weekend, and I'd be right as rain on Monday, you know. So I don't, you know, my 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 wife would know whether I'd hit target or not by the colour of my face when I walked through the door on the Friday end of month, and whether I was speaking or not. And I either be in elation or I'd be in, you know, misery. But by Monday, it was like you know, back on the horse, new month's beginning, get back going again. So I've got that sort of mental. Uh, toughness, if you like. When I was work doing newspapers and radios as well, we were doing copy and you had to be to deadline and that sort of thing. And sometimes you had different publications, so multiple deadlines. So I'm just used to working under that sort of pressurized environment. But obviously, you know, this we're talking serious pressure now. You know, we're talking three kids, big house, one salary, global credit recession, costs of everything going up, you know. Just, just a whirlwind of, of things going on, like you know. And that's it. So, I mean, you were trying to work out there. You're late, late twenties, heading into your thirties at this point, right? No more. Yeah, I got sorry. married at twenty eight. Uh, I think I was the two thousand and five. I think. Hmm. So yeah, this was uh, two thousand and eight. So I was about thirty one, maybe. Because you were saying you had you had uh, sort of ambitions of going MD by thirty, but that sort of drifted. I suppose does that that's covering that period of time I, you know. yeah, well, I, yeah and I allowed it to drift because of you know what was going on around it you know you've got to you've got to be target driven and goal driven you've got to aim for your goals and your, your targets and stuff and not give yourself too much wiggle room but you've also got to be realistic as well you know mm -hmm. it's like now you know there's lots of companies out there that can't survive lockdown you know what I mean so you can't beat yourself up and say oh, I'm missing targets <laughs> you know some things are bigger some things are bigger than than you like you know and your own individual targets you just gotta sort of you know ignore those things really and and and, and still you know reassess your targets give yourself targets but much more uh, achievable you know targets should never be out of reach they should be mm. attainable but they should be attainable at a stretch sure sure in terms yeah. of, I mean I'm interested here. I mean, would you say at that point you were fear driven or greed driven or what would be, what would have been the driver? Um, I was uh, a bit of both. I think I was definitely failure driven. I didn't want to fail, you know, so, you know, I was um, uh, driven by that. Um, I was family driven. I had people I had relying on me and I didn't want to let them down. Um, I was, uh, yeah, just I was just in a whirlwind and doing the best I could to to survive. Really, get get through every day, get through every week, get through every month. You know, handle the pressure and strategize and theorize and try and find a way through it. Like, you know, mm. which I did. Um, I, I, my my ex wife um, couldn't uh, go back to work, 
So I decided uh, we needed a business. So I started a business. So as well as working sort of 70 hours a week for a corporate job, um, I decided we needed a business and it needed to be we rather than me because I was working all the hours and she was at home. So I thought, well, if we do something jointly, then um, I could do the sales, marketing, strategize, the finances, all that sort of stuff. But she could do the day-to-day -day operations and, and the stuff that needed to be done when I was at work. So we started a couple of different businesses. We started one doing um, Swarovski Crystal pet accessories because we had a toy dog at the time, a little toy dog, Maltese mm -hmm. Terrier. And uh, my ex-wife uh, was into um, uh, sparkly things, you know, she's a bit of a magpie. So um, she was, we decided, we found a wholesale supplier of some of these uh, fancy Demonte pet accessories and started selling them. We were a little bit ahead of the curve, but uh, a, a few, uh, I can't remember, it was a few months or maybe a year into that, uh, all the big shops started selling the same stuff as well and they took our market away. So we, um, we decided to diversify and uh, we went into uh, Swarovski crystal shoes and handbags, which we were selling online and buy at expos. We were doing wholesale and retail. All of the businesses um, were picked. Uh, what we did was picked by uh, my, my wife at the time, uh, my ex-wife now, uh, because it needed to be something she had a passion for because my passion was for business, for sales and marketing doing the finance, the strategy, that sort of stuff. So in order to get her on board, it had to be something that she was passionate about as well. And because she was a magpie and she liked her bling, you know, that's why we started off with the pet accessories and moved on to the Swarovski crystal shoes and handbags. And that's how I got her buying into the business. And I was just happy working on a business. So that's, that's interesting. I mean, you, you were sort of able to take your, your sales knowledge and, you know, and it's an interesting teamwork, obviously, that, you know, obviously your wife at the time there had, you know, she had the passion and the, the, the ambition for the product and you had the technical skills and ability to apply that, to apply the pressure to make the diamond as such, you know, it, and, you know to use your own words. That's there, right. So. It's, it's the perfect, um, it's the perfect partnership, really. And obviously her being an executive PA and me used to be a sales director. Now that is a, is a relationship that works anyway. It's a dynamic that works. You know, every uh, successful entrepreneur, especially male, needs a good PA and males usually could benefit from a female um, PA who's much more organized than they are. You know, usually the case, especially if you're a driver or you're, you're a starter, you're ambitious, you're going off and doing stuff. You need somebody to, you know, take care of the day to day stuff, like, you know, the, the stuff that I don't really find exciting, but uh, the people love doing. And so we were a great team. Uh, we were a great team uh, personally and also in the business, like, you know, and she took care of some stuff that maybe I wasn't so passionate about, like maybe the branding or the customer service, you know, the customer experience, because she was a female and she had more skills towards that type of uh, situation. And I did all the, the stuff that she called the boring stuff, you know, the sales, the marketing, the, the finance, the you know, the boring stuff, but the stuff that makes the business work ultimately. That's great. So you were going through that. So, that's, you know, what was that business called out of interest? Uh, it was called Crystal Couture. Like it. Is it still going and, or is uh, it all finished? Um, I, I, I believe uh, my ex-wife is still running it now um it did when we split up which we move on to at some point i'm sure um it did uh, uh nobody did anything with it for a while because of all what was going on and obviously we were two different halves of the business and without each half it, we didn't really have a business and ultimately if she is doing it now she'll be doing it at a different level than than i was doing it at because of obviously my corporate sales experience you know, was much greater than, you know, her level of sales experience and, and wants and desires to even do sales and marketing. So, so yeah, you know, that, that, that business, um, I was doing it sort of for four years, really. Um, one, uh, one year I was doing it mostly on my own while she was heavily pregnant and stuff. And we were doing retail selling at uh, uh, trade shows and selling online and selling on eBay. So we had a website, we had eBay, we had uh, fairs to go to. We also introduced a separate brand called um, uh, I Want uh, Wholesale because our domain name was I Want Crystal Couture, not just Crystal Couture because Crystal Couture was gone. And actually as a domain name, it worked really, really well because it made it more desirable. It's like I Want Crystal Couture, helped with the branding. Um, but then we started off an I Want Wholesale 
because we, we tried to sell our product um, to wholesalers, um, but people were worried about competing with us in the retail space. So I decided that we needed a separate brand in order to sell the product as wholesale so people wouldn't necessarily see our retail uh, competition, if you like. So yeah. I created a different brand in a different name. And, uh, and we, start, we went to um, uh, trade wedding fairs, wholesale wedding fairs, and we sold our products as, uh, as wholesale products to other retailers to sell in their shops and that sort of thing. And when we did a, a big um, a trade fair in Harrogate, which is Europe's biggest trade fair, um, we were one of the three stars of the show in our first year exhibited, like, you know, out of hundreds and hundreds of exhibitors. And that's because we did things properly. We did things like a corporate rather than a startup business. Yeah. That's an interesting, you know, to, to, for you to take that lessons and learnings and be able to, you know, switch that into, you know, the fact of, you know, the product's changed, but you've kept going and not only just surviving, you're absolutely thriving. Yeah, well, that, that business is, is a frustrating one for me because I worked hard on it um, and we were well-ranked SEO. We were selling around the world, you know, we were, we were um, expanding our product range, etc. Not long before I split up with my ex-wife, which is you know, where my involvement in that business stopped, um, we were in talks with Debenhams about having our products uh, be sold online in their shop um, under the special occasion where, and if they'd have gone well under that store, which I know that would have increased our sales massively, maybe tenfold, maybe hundredfold, and then if that, they'd have gone down well in the UK, they would put you on all of the .de and .es domains all around Europe and around the world. So literally, that could have just transformed our business and our lives, like you know. Mm -hmm. and we were just about to have that done, but we needed a, a, an IT integrated solution um, linked to our website in order to monitor the stock. Uh, and, and that was a couple of thousand pounds, which we didn't have at the time because I was working on my own. She hadn't gone back to work. We had three kids, global recession, big mortgage, and we couldn't afford the, the technical development to get that done. So that deal was, was sat there in the pipeline. Also, at the time, uh, my ex-wife um, was a big fan of Towie, and, and they, we knew that was a good audience for Swarovski crystal shoes and handbags. So as well as having the wedding market, we wanted to grow just the fashion market. And I was speaking to the manager, a manager of a couple of the Tawi stars, and we'd uh, agreed a deal in order for them to start selling our products on their websites, because quite a few of the Tawi stars got websites. And uh, that would have picked up our sales as well, because they were hot property at the time. They still pretty much are now, the, the Tawi stars. Um, but we needed to invest in more stock in order to have the stock, stock sat in their warehouses in order for them to do next day delivery for the, for the product. So we sat on two really good deals that we've been to London to, to, to uh, secure and negotiate something which, you know, my, my ex-wife wouldn't have done, but obviously my sales experience of being national gave us the ability to do. And we had these deals lined up and the financial problem just stopped us getting to a point where, you know, we'd have achieved all that we wanted to achieve. Mm. Wow. So it's it's interesting. Was that your start in e-commerce as well? If, if I understood that correctly. Yeah, that was uh, well. You know, yeah, pretty much. That was my start into e-commerce. Um, when I was at Credit Safe um, for eight years, I was managing, and for ten years, I was selling. So I was a player manager, if you like. But about uh, four years in as well, I also re uh, managed the reseller channel it was affiliates and resellers, and. Um, so that's something which I'm passionate about now is introducing affiliates and resellers into all businesses because most businesses don't have it. And it can be a way of actually selling a lot more than just selling to end users. And uh, a lot of those resellers used to sell via e-commerce and online. So that was really my first uh, soiree into the e-commerce world and selling online and SEO and, and that type, type of stuff. And then when I started my, uh, my own business, I used to pick the brains of a lot of my corporate resellers' clients, you know, my clients, because they were selling online. And uh, the ones that were selling online the best and were at the top of the search engines, I used to pick their brains, asking them for SEO advice and information so that I could improve, you know, my own results in my own business. 
And because it was a non-conflicted business, it was a retail business, they used to give me a lot of information. And because I managed lots of these clients, they all would give me a bit of what they knew. So I was building up more knowledge than they knew, like, you know, through a mixture of them all. And that was um, part of my, my reasoning and, and, and part of what I wanted to do when I went self-employed is use that knowledge that I gained to help a lot of people that I knew just didn't have that knowledge. Wow. It's a real, you're constantly learning and picking it up and always driving using forward. It then. Yes, what's the point of learning something and not using it? So I'm very much into learning it and then how do I adapt it into what I'm doing and, and use it to grow what I'm doing? Like, no? mm. So what happened then? Uh, so uh, after about uh, four years of running that business, after you know, coming up to nine years, uh, nearly 10 years married, uh, I suppose the pressure got to me, you know? I think um, working 70 hours a week in one job and in a career, working probably 30, 40 hours a week in another, you know, the financial pressures of uh, having to support a family in a big house and, and all the extra costs of, of a global recession, you know, was, was getting to, to me. It was putting me under more and more pressure. Um, I think, you know, wanting to go off and do my own thing and hadn't delayed it for a while was, was eating away at me because I don't like to miss targets and goals. And, and, and I'm much, um, I'm very much into, you only got one life, so don't have no regrets, live no regrets. I got one big regret already in life, which I got early on, which was I never got to play rugby for Wales. And uh, I never wanted to ever have any more regrets in my life. So I got a, a ticking clock of going off and doing something for yourself, uh, eating away at me. I got financial pressures. I got, you know, working all the hours under the sun. You know, life become a bit miserable during that time. You know, I got three young kids. Life was miserable. I wanted to make some changes to our situation, maybe retract, you know, uh, level off again and build again. But my ex-wife really didn't want to do that. So you know, a disagreement in, in, in a, a way to go forward in life and, you know, uh, an unhappy time consistent for about five years and lots of things going wrong at, at the time. You know, uh, I blew up two engines in my car, didn't have the time and the money to, to fix them and just lots of things going on. Eventually, you know, pop, the balloon popped. And, uh, you know, I, I kept trying to get ourselves out of the financial situation we were in trying to um, maybe downscale and, and, and cut, cut back in our life and, 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 you know, level off a bit in order to build forward. She didn't particularly want to do that. Disagreements come. She would not never um, uh, go with any of my solutions about, you know, how to overcome these problems and to get through them. So eventually I thought, well, we're not doing this together. You know, we're not working as a team and trying to get through it. Mm. I, I can't keep going on like this. So I left. Well, tough time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hardest thing I've ever had to do. It sounds like there was a, a lot of pressure at that particular point and a lot was going on, right? Yeah, 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 lots, lots. You know, but just more than most people can handle. You know, I'm tough. You know, I think a lot of people would have bailed out uh, a lot earlier and a lot sooner than I did. But, you know, I kept fighting because I didn't want to bail out like you know sure and what was your what was your release point then where did where did you go and what was mm. what, what was your getaway so basically um basically I moved in with a mate of mine who's a property developer and I uh, about six months before we split um I just got self-employed so it was the time I was just starting to you know chase my dream if you like and that added to the pressure as well because I was at home all the time and then, you know, trying to get roped into doing the errands and all of that sort of stuff. And I'm trying to focus on building my business and there's a recession going on and we need the income. And I'm getting, you know, asked to do stuff I don't want to do. And, you know, I need to focus on doing other stuff. And lots of, you know, and, and, the, and the fact that, you know, that safety net of, of, of a job and a career had been pulled wasn't playing well on my ex-wife's mind. You know, she'd had an um, unexpected child a, a quick, in quick concession after having our second child. Lots of things going on with her and her head. Lots of pressure for me. And eventually, you know, it popped and I, and I had to leave because there was no other way out of it. So I went to live with my friend. 
and I'm newly self-employed, no house, and I've got, you know, my clothes and my electronics and that's about it with me, starting a fresh sort of thing, you know, renting a room in a mate's house, like, you know. So I, I went a bit off the rails to say, you know, I went, I went, I went partying for a bit, you know, uh, as a bit of a release to that pressure, you know. And so I didn't really need to earn the sort of money that I was earning before. I didn't really think about that. I just thought, you know, just go and enjoy yourself. And, you know, obviously I've been through a five years tough time. The last year had really been tough, tough, tough for, for, for what had happened to happen. And uh, so I just had a release and I enjoyed myself. And I sort of um, plateaued really for a few years, you know, self-employed, new business, just going out networking, getting the odd job that I needed in order to, to pay whatever bills I had. And just plateaued and lost the, the drive, the ambition, the motivation that I've always had in, in my life. Just It just left. Do you think I was a form of depression or something else, or was it just a, maybe you know, maybe like, a like bit a, of a midlife crisis, maybe a bit of depression, maybe uh, a shock, you know, um, mm. maybe a combination of all those things, maybe um, a release, you know, mm. lots of things. But I, I had a great time, you know. I, I've had a great life, and I'm somebody who looks at the 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 upside of most things. Um, I'm a sort of glass full kind of guy, you know, not interested in half half full glasses. Um, so, you know, I had a good time. I got to spend some time bonding with a mate of mine, which I hadn't got to see that much over that time. I got to see him, you know, um, you know, infrequently at parties and occasions or whatever, but I got to really, you know, live with someone and bond with them. That sort of friendship you have when you're younger and you're in each other's pockets all the time. You know, I rekindled that and, you know, had a great time. Um, you know, we're still, you know, chasing my dreams, still working and still still out there trying to build a business and a reputation and stuff. But uh, just with a, a big knockback, uh, I had some financial problems as a as a, a outcome of, of just leaving, you know, my, my situation. So I had some knock on financial problems, which, you know, six months into a, a self-employed business didn't help. Uh, and I'm running... I lost my bank account, which was a joint account because of a loan that we had, which he didn't pay when I left, um, which which was from our joint account. So I had my bank account taken off me and I was running around off a card cash account with no no benefits or anything. You know, something I, I set up when I was 18. You know, I was just financially a, a worse off than when I was 18, really. Well, I was quite a... Um... Quite a point of leveling, as you say. It's almost you know you're you're back to back to a point. You have a life of experience, yeah. but you're back yes, to level. Uh, uh, it's uh, yeah, it was a big thing, you know, a big hurdle to have to overcome, which is why it took it took a number of years. Like you know what I mean? I was I was out networking, doing going through the motions, getting customers, but little customers, not really, no ambition, no drive, no no progression, just just you know doing what most people do i suppose in their lives in existing sure you know? so what happened then uh, so uh, this is the bounce back bit of my bounce back story so uh, probably two or three years passed and uh, i decided you know what um, time to get back on the horse time to get back motivated time to get back driven time to bet uh, you know start achieving again and, and progressing you know, enough's enough, you know, get over yourself, get over the situation and get on with it, really. So I started doing some self-development, some personal development, um, started uh, goal setting, something I've always done all through my life, uh, always used, um, always had small, medium and long-term goals. So the long-term goals is stuff you're doing constantly, aiming to get towards that final destination medium term goals, you know, things like, uh, you know, where you want to be in your career and where you want to be in your house and your life and your property and that. And short term goals, uh, goals, you know, what am I trying to achieve this day, this week, this month, you know, and I've always worked that way. And so I started um, put, giving myself those goals and those targets. I started, um, I wrote yellow post-it notes and put them all around my mirror, things I wanted to achieve, things I wanted to do. Um, and uh, I give myself the pleasure of ripping them off when I achieve them. 
So, you know, I was looking forward to, uh, I filled my, I had a big mirror on my bedroom wall and I filled uh, yellow post-it notes right way around the, 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 the rim of the mirror. And uh, I just started ripping off post-its, started achieving, started doing the things I wanted to do. Set myself small, medium, and long-term goals, stepping stones, started personal developing. Um, I was networking a lot of the time at Intrabiz, which is Wales' biggest business network. And uh, they have a lot of entrepreneur speakers at their expo and, and at their events. So I started listening and, and meeting some of these people, people like Kevin Green, who's uh, uh, one of the UK's largest private property landlords and a great speaker, um, a great educator. I've been on a few of his wealth courses, etc. cetera. Um, I also used to do quite a lot of networking with, with Intrabiz and for Intrabiz. So one year I, I, I volunteered to attend uh, the business show in London, which is one of the biggest business shows in Europe. And I was uh, basically representing Intrabiz on their stand and doing a lot of networking for them, et cetera. And uh, they had a meeting following the event, which is a couple of days event. They had a meeting with uh, Grant Cardone. Uh, they were um, trying to line him up to be a speaker at their expo. And because I volunteered to go with them to London and network with them, I was invited to attend the meeting just by chance. Happened to go there. Didn't even know who Grant Cardone was. And uh, met Grant Cardone and his uh, lovely wife, Elena, as well, and their kids. Had a great time in that meeting. A lot of energy in the room. Eventually, Intrabiz got Grant Cardone to come to the UK a year later in collaboration with a few other people. And uh, from that point onwards, I was using Grant Cardone as a sort of yardstick to, to what, because Grant Cardone is the person out of all the entrepreneurs I've listened to and speak to, uh, spoke to and met and whatever. He's the one who's most like me and is living life the way I would want to live my life. So he's become a mentor to me, really, because he does and says everything that, to me that I need to say to myself. But it's good to hear it from a different voice. So rather than just like with most entrepreneurs and, and successful people I've met, and I've met loads of them, usually I take a little bit of gold nugget off them and add it to my own strategy and my own life. But with Grant, I take lots of chunks because he, he, he's a sales and marketing specialist, the same as me. He's a property developer, something I've always been interested in and something I want to get into. I, I got a property maintenance business on the side in collaboration with a friend of mine because I want to get and understand the world of property more and I can't financially get into it yet. So um, so I've been learning and, and, and taking a lot of useful information from Grant Cardone. I've also taken a lot of useful information from Elena Cardone. Um, I've met Dr. John Martini uh, through an event um, which Pat Slattery jointly did with Intrabiz. So I, I, I listened to a met Dr. John Martini. And if there's a guy that you can learn a lot of stuff off, I'm into psychology and physiology. And Dr. John Martini's read over 33,000 books. Uh, he's a legend. And so I've listened to him. You know, I've listened to uh, more recently, Mark Victor Hansen, Chicken Soup for the Soul. Um, I've uh, listened to uh, Lord Sugar at uh, Intrabiz Expo, Hilary DeVay. Um, I've been on Rich Dad Poor Dad seminars. Um, I've done done everything really. So you know, lots of personal development, as well as well as um, your know, goal setting and upskilling. I've always been a lifelong learner, and uh, up to the age of around thirty nine, you know, I knew a lot. But from thirty nine to nearly forty three now, I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot because I was always self-teaching myself stuff. I'm somebody who's always used Google. People ask me how to do stuff and I just whack it onto Google. You know what I mean? If I need to know how to do something, I'll just go onto YouTube or onto Google or whichever way teach, takes me to the best place. I'm a self-learner. I like to learn by video, but I also you know, I don't mind reading books. I'd rather watch the movie. Um, I retain information. I watch all of the programs, The Apprentice, Dragon's Den, you know, the Hotel Inspector, property programs, you know, Homes Under the Hammer, um, you know, Moving Abroad, um, uh, the, the Secret Millionaire, you know, I watch them all. And the thing is, I learn by osmosis. It's the way I like to teach as well. So learn by watching and observing. It's the way kids learn to learn. You know, you don't need to be taught something. You just need to observe and you'll learn out, out, you'll work out how to do something. Yeah, it makes sense. I know uh, it's, a, I just, I'm interested there. I mean, you, you talked about almost 
getting back on the the horse and getting over yourself and the goal setting side and going on this personal development uh, journey. What what do you remember? What the turning point was? You know that sort of. Yeah, well, I uh, I don't think this was exactly the turning point, but it definitely helped. Um, four or five years after splitting up with my ex-wife, so we split up because of, you know, I left or whatever. And for five years, I was having my children every weekend, pretty much. Now, I probably missed about uh, maybe five weekends in, in five years. And then uh, one day, um, my uh, ex-wife's uh, cousin, passed away unexpectedly at 40 and uh, she had a funeral she had to go into in midweek and I was used to having my kids Friday to Sunday or Saturday morning to Sunday night so you know I was two and a half days or, or two days and I was in the routine of having them on the weekend and not having them in the week and just being busy in the week so I agreed I'd uh, have the children for a funeral on a, a Wednesday I think it was and uh, my phone was upstairs. I fell asleep on the settee, something I do quite often while I was watching films. You know, <laughs> a habit I haven't got out of watching movies late at night. And, um, and so I had websites to design the next day. So I, I, I got up and just started working on my website, thinking, you know what, I could do without my phone today. It was upstairs in my bedroom on charge. I was downstairs, uh, you know, working away on, on web design. And I completely forgot that I'd agreed to have the kids for this funeral. So uh, she's ringing me, ringing me, ringing me, trying to get hold of me, losing her temper, you know, depressed because of, uh, of the situation and the funeral and whatever, under terrible pressure, you know, to have to make the funeral. Um, in the end, she had to get a neighbour to help, and I missed all the calls. And, you know, I, I got back to my phone after building a website all day, later on in the day, and realised the error that I'd done. But she, in a not very sensible state at the time obviously grieving for her cousin and stuff decided that was a, a straw that broke the camel's back and she was going to stop me getting access to my kids and she, she used the kids against me like you use a pawn in a game of chess i suppose and uh and, and that's been going on now for a couple of years so uh so that's one of the things that sort of got me to uh say okay well you know i need to do something about my situation because obviously she she wasn't enjoying the fact that, you know, I was partying and maybe gone into this off the rails phase. And I was still having my kids every weekend, but maybe I wasn't contributing as much as she would have liked and as, because I just didn't have it, you know? Sure, so sure. one of those situations which can get out of hand and a bit bitter. Sure, makes sense. So in terms of going into the, the personal development, where was your initial go-to point then? You know, is there any particular So my person? first go point... My first two go-to point was I'm self-reliant. So it was just, you know, get on and do this yourself. So the actual whole personal development journey happened, I think, because of that chance meeting that I happened to be in when I was volunteering to help friends of mine at an event, which is why I always say yes to stuff and you never know what's going to come from it. I ended up with a chance meeting to Grand Cardone and that got me interested in learning off other people. Other than watching Branson from afar, I'd never really learned off anyone else. I've always been self-taught. I teach mm. myself everything. I taught myself web design, SEO, social media, LinkedIn. I teach, I'm a detailed person. I love to work out how things, I play around with stuff and tinker until I know, I like to get the most out of everything. Most people stop at around 70, 80%, but I like to get 90, 100% out of whatever it is, whether it be your phone or LinkedIn or, you know, SEO services, whatever. I like to get the most out of it, like, you know? Sure. So, 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 but that chance meeting put me on a, a path of personal development from learning off other people as well. And so, um, and what I've learned by doing that is that you can accelerate your learning much quicker because if you learn off the best people in the world at what it is you want to become the best in the world at, which is my strategy, then you're going to get to that place much quicker than if you have to learn it all yourself. Makes sense. So yeah, so I mean, obviously learning the values, learning the, the skill sets and, and which is quite a transition because before you were saying you were all self-learning and now you're actually actively looking to people to see who you can learn off. Yeah, well, I'm still self-learning. I, I'm, I'm not one of these uh, people who um, talks the talk without walking the walk. Um, I'm somebody who believes passionately 
in that, you know, if you're going to share knowledge and you've got to have been there and done that and, and, and walk the walk. And a lot of people share knowledge and theory and that sort of thing. And I remember from the school days uh, doing accounts, uh, uh, sorry, doing sciences and stuff, and you had to hypothesize, and then you had to do tests and experiments and benchmarking to, to prove the theory. Mm. And, um, and that's something which, you know, I, I'm somebody who, who learns stuff and then puts it into action to really learn it. You know, it's only by putting, taking the, that action do you really get to understand it. So like people like Richard Branson or whatever will, will say to you, you know, say yes and learn how to do it later. And, uh, and I'm a bit like that. I, I, I never say no to opportunities. I'll, I'll always say yes and I'll work out how to do it or I'll find someone else out, uh, who knows how to do it and, and, and do it with them. But, um, but yeah, you know, so, so I am a, I, I don't mind taking information off other people, but I will always test it as well test the theory and and and, and, and i'm not um i'm not worried about you know not taking stuff off people as well because i understand that we're all different and we all got different ways of doing things so just because it works for someone else who's successful don't mean that it would make me successful doing the same thing i gotta sure. know myself be in touch with myself and realize what's gonna work for me totally makes sense Interestingly, I mean, hopefully it's sort of up to date now, but I mean, what would you say are your core values then? So um, my core values are, um, I love helping people. That's, that's value number one. So, so I think you should treat people how you want to be treated. Yeah. And you should, um, you should help people. You know, I'm a massive believer in sort of karma. Well, what goes around comes around. I was brought up a Catholic and I'm not really religious anymore. But I'm a bit spiritual, if you like. You know, I think, you know, if you do good to people, people will do good to you. If you look after people, it's going to come back in, in return. And it's definitely happened so many times in my life, especially, you know, I've been successful most of my life and always done good things for other people. But in my time of need, I had lots of people around me who, who, who helped me because, you know, what goes around comes around. And so I believe in just being a good person, helping people whenever possible, and uh you know traditional values really i'm quite traditionalist in, in a lot of my um views not in things like you know men and women and that you know that's got to modernize but in like you know respecting people respecting your elders um you know joining in together being part of a team just the things that make the human race human people good and the human race get along together better like you know no, absolutely makes sense so where so that brings us more or less up to today really does it um yeah really yeah so so there's there's a few more things to my uh, bounce back story which are in my book so people uh, i've got to work out how to publish it and where to publish it and all the rest of that at the moment mm -hmm. but i've helped a few other people along the way with the same sort of skills and strategies that i've been using so as other people have come into my life that have needed the help, I've decided and started taking on them as projects as well, because maybe they haven't got the same experience that I've got. You know, there's maybe the same willpower, the same knowledge or whatever. So I've implemented the yellow post-it uh, uh, story uh, to a friend of mine who phoned me out of the blue um, with a, a, a phone call that basically said, uh, if I don't, help him he's not going to be around on this planet much longer so I, I took on board uh, an old friend of mine that i'd lost a bit of touch with give him a, a place to live and uh, a place to stay and, and, and clean himself up and all that sort of thing and then i got him to do the yellow post-it strategy and a bit of personal development and motivation and whatever as well so you know i love helping people and if i've got a a, a method or a technique which i can use to help people when they're down mm -hmm. help bring them back then I think that's my wider purpose in life. Wow. Okay. This is real. That's it's great. There's some really strong values there, which is, uh, you, know, you obviously get a lot out of giving. Yeah. 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 I think, um, so I've, 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 I've realized I'm not massively materialistic, which is another reason why maybe, maybe my ex didn't get on so well at the end, but I like experiences and I like people and I like experiences with people. Mm. And, um, what I've realized is a lot of people are out there striving for success, wealth, success, money, success, mm. Mm. so that they can buy shiny things. But ultimately those shiny things will lose their shine after a while. You get a bigger house, a bigger car, 
you know, a bigger yacht or whatever. But after a while, you start losing the buzz of getting those things. So um, what happens then is entrepreneurs then become philanth philanthropists and they start giving back because that's the only real way that they can get buzz. So what I've realized is while I'm on my journey to build a billion, it's just become a phil philanthropist. I just start helping people now. That way then I get a lifelong satisfaction of helping people rather than just do it later on. And if I can build my billions along the way, then great. But if not, I'm wealthy in people and experience. And ultimately that's far more important to me than things. Makes sense. It's, yeah, I mean, I was going to say that because I mean, what, what for you is the definition of success then? Yeah, so, so, so if I won the lottery tomorrow, I'd probably find a way of putting a fund together, which I could help start, like people, kids who want to get into business, so I can help them and advise them, give them all my information and help them on their journey and be a mentor to them. Um, I'd probably do something like that. And, and, and if I can develop programs and skills to help people get over their hiccups in life, whatever they may be, um, then I'd love to do that too. So if I ever win the lottery, that's what I'm going to do with it. I'm going to use the money to help other people. And if I can become a best-selling author and global speaker and uh, a well-known poet and, and all the things I do in order to become well-known, in order to try and get to a stage where I can help more people, if all of those things come off and I, and I get to a point where I can be financially successful, then I can use that financial success to along with my knowledge and experience to become properly wealthy in life by of helping as many people on the planet and supporting as many people on the planet and being connected to as many people on the planet as i possibly can be mm. that makes sense just curiosity i'll take you back a wee bit i mean you talked there at one point you know and in, in the sort of hierarchy in the sales is you talked about being a player um, I think it was being a player and a manager, if I remember rightly. Yeah, and a player manager, both like, you know. So what's what's a player in that instance? Well, you know, a player is, uh, you know, somebody who's just doing sales and not managing, really. You know, so like a player manager in a football team would be somebody who's coaching and managing. So a lot of people go into management because they're not very good at sales or they're bored of sales or they're burnt out and they don't want to keep selling. So that's why a lot of people will go into management. But I loved selling. I, lo I still love it now. It's a passion of mine. I love the buzz of making a sale. And so when I got into management, it's because I wanted to progress my career and progress my earnings. Mm. But it was never because of a lack of love of sales or selling. So I, I, I maintained the player manager status. One of my all-time heroes growing up as a kid was Kenny Daglish. And he was a player manager for Liverpool when he first started and we won a lot of stuff. And so, you know, I thought, well, yeah, you know, I don't need to just, I don't need to hang up my boots. I can still play. I can still sell and, and become a, 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 still be a good salesperson. But whilst I'm helping other people on their journey to being good salespeople as well. So I was one of the two top sellers in the company for 10 years whilst running the, 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 the corporate sales team for eight of those 10 years. And I was managing the reseller channel for six of the 10 years as well. I was doing what in reality is three full-time jobs and I was doing them all well. Wow. That's a, that's a serious amount of energy you're involved as well. Oh, I, I, I literally work from the moment I wake up to the moment I go to bed every day. You know, one of the reasons probably I had a bit of a falling out with my ex-wife as well, but I was trying to pick up her slack, you know, cause she wasn't uh, working. So we were doing a bunch of joint business together. So, you know, I was sometimes getting it in the neck for working all the time, but I was in a situation where I had to work all the time. Mm. This sounds like a, you know? a difference in values almost. But yes. You know, um, and that's the, you know, that's the problem with, with, with marriage sometimes is that you go into it with different values and it takes something big sometimes for you to realize those different values. And, mm. you know, that's why a lot of managers fail, I think, because one, not everyone's always honest about their values up front. And also, two, sometimes you, your values change as well. So sometimes you can be symmetrical with similar values, but then they, they differ over time. Mm. So, you know, it's one of those things at the end of the day. But, um, you know, you, 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 can't, you can't hold yourself to blame for when these things happen, especially if you've, you know, to me, 
you should never just give up on something. You know what I mean? And I just never give up on something. You should always try your best. But sooner or later, you, you also only got one life. You know what I mean? So you can't, you know, I always used to say if the, the bad days outweigh the good, then it's time to move on. You know what I mean? Because you've only got one life. Absolutely. You know, and, and you used a term there, you know, it's um, live life with no regrets. And ironically, it's a saying that's, that's on my, my father's headstone. You know, yeah. live life with no regrets is, is a it's a very strong strong thing that resonates with me a lot you know but yeah i think um i think you know you're never you're never gonna uh, be on your deathbed thinking about all the things that you tried in life but didn't quite um succeed at hmm. but you would be on your deathbed i would be definitely if there was a load of things i wish i'd done but i just didn't have the balls or the guts or the energy or the drive to actually try you know what i mean and like i say one of my biggest regrets was something you know because of circumstances and stuff, I really do think I could have made it uh, as a professional rugby player and maybe even played for Wales and nothing would have given me greater pleasure than that. Yeah, nothing, you know, that, that would have been my life, my boyhood dream, my, my whole life in one if I could have just made that happen. And I'm never going to let anything else as big as that, especially slip my palms. Like, you know what I mean? It's not, it's not. So, so if, if I, I, I've wanted to be a global speaker, best-selling author or whatever for a couple of years now. And actually in lockdown, I, I just wrote a book, you know? So if I, if I, I, I thought well, if you can't write a book, cause I'm busy all the time, but I just thought if you can't write a, a book when you're in lockdown, then you, you're never going to write a book. So I wrote one and I wrote it in a day because uh, Grant Cardone, uh, in, in one of his talks, along, uh, uh, whether I listened to a long time ago, said he wrote a book in a day, one of his first books, and he became a, a best, uh, New York Times bestselling author. And I met Grant Cardone, and, and Grant Cardone's a legend at sales, marketing, and uh, property. But I'm a legend at sales and marketing, and I'm working on the property bit. So, you know, if he could do something, I can do it. And that's what the biggest inspiration I got off Grant Cardone is, you know, I know the same stuff he does. You know, he's inspired me to take what I do and put it on a larger stage. So if he wrote, wrote a book in a day, I thought I could write a book in a day. So when I had the idea of finally crystallizing my head that I could write a book, I wrote it in a day. You know, I've, I've been back and um, edited bits and add some more colour and a bit of, you know, Odd paragraph here and there, but pretty much the story was written from 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 start to beginning in a day, like, you know. Mm. Oh, totally. Well, fair play. So, have you got a title for the book? Oh uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I, I did mention it earlier. It's going to be mm. called uh, "Bounce Back: A Human cool. Survival Story." Yeah, and it actually is set around uh, uh, the coronavirus situation that we're in now, uh, and it's my life story of bouncing back, but also the story of some of the other people I've also helped to bounce back. And, and that's the story in it. But I'm also going to um, share uh, what I learned along the way. Brilliant. I love that's, that. So it's going to be a self-help book and what I mm. learned off the people I've learned from, you know, um, tips about, you know, some of the skills I've learned and just try and cram in as much as I can into a book. I've written some poems the last three days, three, uh, a poem a day for three days in a row. Uh, two of them coronavirus based and one of them how to make a diamond based, which is a metaphor for entrepreneurial. Is mm -hmm. and I'm going to stick them in the book as well. So it's just going to be a useful book of uh, useful information for entrepreneurs, really. So this uh, this quiet and this this slowdown and all has actually served you well, it seems. Oh, uh, coronavirus is 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 has been great to me, really. It's been fantastic, like you know, because um, it's a reset. The last reset was the global credit crunch, and I got mm. chewed and chewed up and spat out in the last global credit crunch. I'm making sure I'm not going to get chewed up and spat out in this one, in this reset. So I'm full steam ahead at the moment. I'm, uh, there's a, a saying I love, which is in one of my poems, which I wrote today, actually, um, which is when the going gets tough, the tough get going. Mm -hmm. And because uh, I've been in pressurized environments all my life, I sometimes need adversity in order to really shine. And so since coronavirus has come, I've up my game, you know, tenfold. And uh, I've written a book. I've written three poems. I've created a hashtag positive coronavirus news because I don't like the negativity that's always in the news. So I'm trying to I'm trying to counterbalance that with a bit of yin for the yang. And uh, I do that. I, I'm like that before coronavirus. I just don't. I think there's always too much negativity. So I'm mm. always trying to share 
business and sports news, which is much more positive. Mm. And, uh, and I've started sharing positive coronavirus news now because it's just a wave of, of negativity. And I think um, people's mental health can be affected massively by that. And so I myself don't switch, I don't tune into it and I switch it off. I don't watch a lot of that negativity. Um, uh, but I, you know, I'm just trying to, for those that are watching it, I'm just trying to offer a bit of counterbalance. Like, you know? mm. That makes sense. And interestingly, you know, you, you obviously you talked about, you know, how you evolve and, and you grow efficiencies. I suppose being where you are in business today, I mean, what, what is the sort of years of all the you know, sales and different projects and things? What, what's your style of business now and what do you think you've learned? Well, on efficiency, first of all, my style of business since, since working in a tech startup days and, and selling IT solutions, but also going back to doing my coursework and, and stuff on a computer, you know, my, my, my efficiencies is always use technology, 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 whenever possible to give you a, a head start and a leg up. Yeah. So like the fact that um, all networking, I do a lot of online networking now, it's all gone on to Zoom. It means instead of doing two or three events a week, I'm doing two or three events a day. So actually you, utilizing technology is helping me to, to reach out to more people. Mm. I'm also um, uh, you know, using technology to, to somehow help me with my publishing of my book. I'm using technology to spread the word of positivity through a hashtag you know, on social media. Mm. I'm into efficiency, so I blog a lot so that my posts automatically go to my social media. So therefore I'm efficiently marketing without having to go in and share the posts via all the different platforms. So I'm, I'm constantly looking for uh, innovative and creative ways to get more done so I can uh, achieve more and do more really. Because mm. um, it's a race, we're all in a race. This is a reset now, it's the start of a race. But whoever does the best, the most activity, the best stuff, becomes the most known over the next sort of 10 years, 15 years, and the ones who are going to be successful, you know, up until the next reset. Mm. Yeah, it's all a big cycle, really, isn't it? You know, and as you say, you, you got chewed up the last time, and this time you're, you've obviously learned a lot. Yeah, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. Very, and very and sometimes, um, sometimes it's a fortune. At the end of the day, the last time I wasn't... Um, <laughs> I wasn't do it stupid or doing the wrong things. I was just unlucky. You know what I mean? And that's, you know, sometimes we're unlucky in life and sometimes we're lucky, you know, mm. just depends. But you can make your own luck, you know. You can, I've never been one to take part in lucky dips and lucky competitions and that sort of stuff. I'd rather back myself. So I take part in competitions where, you know, you've got to test yourself or you've got to do something. And, you know, I'd rather back my skills than back luck or chance. But, um, yeah, you know, whichever way, you know, sometimes ride the luck. If you're lucky, ride the luck. If not, make your luck. Mm -hmm. But don't just, if you're down, don't stay down. And if things are going well, don't get complacent because they can easily go down again. Like, you know, so you're just going to keep at it, like, you know. Sure, sure. I just out of interest, I mean, what advice would you have for your so younger self? I mean, I suppose there, 15, 16 was a key thing. What would you be saying to you now? I don't know, actually. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's an interesting one because if I hadn't gone into sales and entrepreneurialism, I think I would have ended up you know, in entrepreneurialism at some point. But I was good academically. and what, At some point a while back, I was thinking, oh, would it be nice if I'd become a lawyer? Because a lawyer is a salesperson that gets paid well. Yeah, because mm -hmm. then I was selling the guilt or the innocence of someone. And I love negotiating and debating and arguing and that sort of stuff. And I love, you know, proving the case that we're the best against the others you know so proving the case and so i would have loved to be a lawyer in another life but i love being an entrepreneur i love doing what i'm doing i love all of that so you know so i'm probably you know secretly glad that i did go down the sales route and not go to uh, a university and all of that um i'm gutted you know i didn't pursue my rugby career um, and I was the fastest boy in junior school and uh, one of the three fastest boy, boys in high school. And I used to play number eight and the other two fastest boys were the two wingers in the rugby team. So, you know, I probably regret the fact I didn't carry on you know, using my speed and, and, and running. Um, what else would I tell myself? I tell myself not to get into a 6.25% uh, mortgage and hold off for a bit. Um, I tell myself... Um, 
to when I was earning the money and that to put a bit aside so that I could have done the uh, the Debenhams deal and, and the stocking of the um, of the product for the uh, Towie girls, you know, bits like that, you know. But I don't have many regrets because I live a life with no regrets. Mm. Absolutely. That was great. It's it's a really in- inspiring sort of journey. Just out of interest, I mean, is there any particular uh, holidays or parties that stand out for you? Because you you mentioned obviously that was a, a big thing for you. Yeah, well, um, so I, I've been to Ibiza five times. Uh, I, I tend to go every four years. So um, I've been since I've been split up with my uh, with my ex-wife, and before that, I went with her with her, and I'm due to do that again soon. So that might be on my radar soon. I seem to go every four years, and I've done since I was eighteen. Um, I um, I've recently, uh, sorry, one of my yellow post-its, I always wanted to live in Panaf Marina, and I've recently just moved to Panaf Marina, so that was like a big yellow post-it that I ripped off. And um, and so even under lockdown, uh, some of my neighbours have been out uh, having a, a drink in the sun, you know, in their own garden. So I've been involved in a bit of that, so I've met the neighbours. I'm out on my bike, uh, and I'm exercising in the, in the house regularly. So I'm probably out more now than I was under lockdown because I'm using my hour a day to get out on the bike. Uh, in Panaf Marina, there's a bay, there's a barrage. You have a look at it online, Cardiff Bay and Panaf Marina. And uh, basically there's like a big cycle route. I think it's either 6K or 10K, something like that. So mm. I'm riding that every sort of hour, so for an hour a day. So I'm getting out, I'm getting physically fit because... Uh, you know, there's a virus going. If I catch it, I want to beat it. You know, I've, I've, I've beaten loads of viruses anyway, and I got quite a good immune system. Like I said, I never used to have much time off work. Uh, I, I've never really taken much medication. I've always used the power of the mind uh, and natural remedies. So if I'm feeling down, um, I would get out in the sun or do some exercise, ride a bike. Uh, if I've got uh, pains or aches or whatever, I might have some comfort food or whatever. I, I've never been one for taking medication. And I'm one that believes in the power of the mind. And um, so, yeah, and that's why I share positivity. You know, I'm trying to help other people with their mental health. My mate who I um, helped bounce back in his life, he was in a bad state, you know, on drugs, on the street, suffering with his mental health. Now, he's taking loads of medication and everything. I got him off the street. I got him off drugs. I got him off most of his medication. We're now partners in business together. Um, you know, there's ways of doing stuff and the, the brain is the most powerful tool that we've got. So get your brain right and the rest will follow. Wow. That's, that's, that is powerful. That's, it really is something else. Just out of curiosity then, I mean, again, if you were to summarize fire in the belly in one or a few words, what would that be for you then? Well, uh, I think it's chase your passion and have no regrets. Do what mm. you love. No, I love it. You know, I love it. That's why the fire in the belly is. You know, go and do what you love. Don't listen to the people who say you can't, because you can. Absolutely. My guest's been really insightful. So tell me, how can people get a hold of you? You know, who are you best serving? What's the go-to um, point here? So they can visit me on my website, which is uh, uh, mikearmstrong.me. Um, is coaching and mentoring available via there plus there's lots of my news and information and there's some online products and services they can ring me uh, my number is 07960 872549 and that's in the UK which is 0044 um, so you can ring me and have a chat I like to network so we can just have a chat see if we can collaborate on something or how I can help you um, I'm on LinkedIn under Michael Armstrong and Michael Armstrong. Uh, I'm on uh, Twitter and Facebook under both Michael Armstrong and Michael Armstrong. Um, I've got an online marketing brand in Wales called Welsh Biz. You can find me on there. Um, I've got a website called marketing.wales. Uh, I've got a, a company website called maconsultancycardiff.com. Um, you can do a Google search for hashtag Michael Armstrong quotes or hashtag positive coronavirus. Um, you can download my book soon once I get it somewhere which you can download probably on Amazon I've got a few podcasts and YouTube channels you can pretty much catch me anywhere I'm in the world of digital marketing and I have multiple accounts and multiple pages and multiple groups so connect with me however you want to connect with me connect with me 
If you want some free sales and marketing help or advice, I'm willing to offer that for you. If I can do some services or anything, but it's the strategy and the advice that I'm really looking to, to grow in the area of my business. I want people mm -hmm. who want to grow their businesses and are willing to do whatever it takes to do it because I'm willing to do whatever it takes to work with them to help them do it. Sure. Wow, well, right. that's, a, that's a serious uh, social media list you have going on. <laughs> so. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't really cover half of it. So I, I already covered the top ones, like, no. No, that's great. Listen, I mean, there's, there's so much, so much great information there. No doubt, there's you know, a lot of people there will, uh, you know, one your journey and, and your drive and your passion, which really shines through. You know, no regrets again. Like I say, it's something that resonates really strong with me, strong with, strongly with me. Um, you know, I love there. You know, there's so, so many things. You know, it's, you know, just and again to see that entrepreneurship from such an early age and passion and drive. <laughs> An energy you know it's it's wow it's it's really powerful so what one, one of the key things which i would say is uh, people don't know what they don't know okay mm. so you should always be willing to learn plus i being part of a, a a journey which grew a team from 300 grand to 5.7 million most businesses never get above 1 million at the same time i was part of a company that grew to 25 million turnover in 10 years they're now turning over 125 million turnover in 10 countries uh, eight, eight years later, so in 18 years. I've been part of something that most people never see and never experience. As well as that, I used to deal with 10 million plus turnover companies and I used to go in and offer them solutions and find out how their business works. Yeah? I also used to manage a reseller affiliate channel, which was entrepreneurial people that was succeeding very well in, in, in business. I've learned a lot from a lot of people and I've experienced a lot. And people don't know what they don't know, but if they speak to me, I can give them some idea of some of the stuff they don't know. And then I can help them out with understanding and knowing what they don't know. Mm. And so, you know, what I would say is if you're a business that has ambition to grow way beyond where you're at at the moment, and you want to learn from someone else who's learned, you know, how to, to do that, and, and some of the growing pains, how to deal with them and, and that sort of thing, then that's really, you know, who I need to speak, be speaking with. Wow. That's so, there's so much good information there and so much you, you can do to help. It's, it's, it's awesome. So your main point of contact there is the MikeArmstrong.me and then obviously all your, your, your key channels there, obviously your Facebook. Your yeah, MikeArmstrong.me or MAConsultancyCardiff.com, my two main websites. I've got lots of, I've got a few other websites. I've got uh, 333 websitescouk marketing.wales. Um, I've got a, a free online uh, website builder for people who want to build a website who can't afford me to, to build it for them. I've got all sorts of stuff going on. Uh, but if you search for Mike Armstrong or Michael Armstrong, uh, especially Cardiff or Wales, I'll come up at the top of the search engines and, you know, get in touch with me, email me, maconsultancy1 at gmail.com, ring me, you know, connect however you want to connect and let's start a, a relationship together. Beautiful. Mike, listen, genuinely, thank you so much for sharing your story and uh, we look forward to hearing lots more from you in the future. So thank you again. Brilliant. And uh, thank you very much for your time and for putting on such a great podcast. Thank you.